I'll tell you what, a Spanish Grand Prix go, that was a really good one. Actually, his Grand Prix in general go, that was a good one. A lot of fun, interesting scenarios, perilous mishaps, and championship shifting events. Good stuff. Well done, Spain. And well done once again to the 2022 cars. So, following the Spanish Grand Prix, let's focus on a few key things that showed themselves. First, we'll look at cooling and why that's so important in blazing temperatures like we saw in Barcelona. And on the back of that heat, let's look at the aggressive tyre strategies that ended up throwing simple plans out of the window and whether Hamilton could have challenged for a win here without that puncture. And speaking of Merck, are they about to disrupt the championship? And how do we feel about Red Bull pulling out the heavy team orders card on Perez, not once, but twice during the race? Let us discuss. So cooling then. All cars need to do it, and they have to do it without fans. They just have to use the natural passing of the atmospheric air. So, why do the cars need cooling anyway? What actually happens if the internals get too hot? Well, most of the mechanical parts, the engine and its pistons and cylinders, the exhaust piping, the gearbox, the transmission, all of that good stuff is made of metal, naturally, which can change shape and structure with changes in temperature. Some parts can undergo thermal expansion, which means they increase in size, bulge slightly from their desired shape. Other parts can lose integrity if the heat softens them slightly. As the workings on power units and transmissions and so on are made to be tightly packaged and work extremely well with as little weight and space as possible, any warping of the shape and size of parts could cause increased friction as parts rub or collide, could break seals and welded joints, could damage wiring, one bit of damage or failure then often tends to cascade to another as heat and fluids become uncontained within the system, destroying large parts of the engine or transmission or whatever. Any points of weakness like a joint or interaction point are incredibly vulnerable to the effects of an overheating car. So what can be done about it? Well, obviously what you want to do is transfer the heat from the car to literally anywhere else. And that's done via a heat sink. In thermodynamics, you know, the physics of heat and energy transfer, a heat sink is, in the most basic terms, just a place to dump all your heat away from the working system. So if you've got an engine or something working away, you want to dump the heat from that engine into a place where it's not going to get reintroduced into that system. Where, as far as the car is concerned, that heat is gone. Now, in practical terms, especially in electronics, you might hear the word heat sink used to describe the device or system that takes care of all the heat exchanging, like a radiator or something. So what are we dumping all the heat into? Well, the cool ambient air passing over the car. Cool is a relative term here. In Spain, the air temperature was about 30 degrees Celsius, which isn't exactly cool for humans, but compared to the 100 plus degrees inside the car, it is cool. And as heat flows from hot to cold substances, we can transfer the heat from the engine into the cool air passing by and boom, the heat is gone. And you might just think, pop open some air intakes, let the air breeze over the engine and let it take the heat from the components as it breezes by. But this is extremely inefficient. Simplistically speaking, the air particles can only take heat from whatever they touch as they travel by. So if we just let the air in to brush up against the engine, it can only absorb heat through the surface of the engine, which means all the rest of the heat inside is crowding up, waiting to be ascended to Valhalla. Of course, this is an extremely simplified model of things, but you understand the idea. So how do we get rid of heat faster? Well, you've got to increase the available surface area to allow a faster heat exchange and get as many hot, hot, particle to particle interactions going on at once. Now, obviously you can't make an engine that's this shape, or this shape, or this shape. So that's where fluids and radiators come into play. What you can do is pump fluid into narrow pipes with lots of lovely surface area through the engine and then out to a radiator. The heat flows into the fluid in the pipes as they pass through the engine. The fluid then carries the heat through a radiator which is designed to have nice big open surface area, perfect for passing airstreams. The heat exchange between the fluid in the radiator and the cool airflow is quick and efficient and the now hot air is ejected from the car into the atmosphere. Hooray! The engine cooling fluid is a mix of water and glycol kept in a pressurised system that allows it to get nice and hot without boiling. Other parts of the car used oil-based cooling, but the idea is the same. Get that heat out of the heat generating bit of the car and off into the airstream. Now, to get that hot air into the atmosphere, you've got to get it out of the car. And the teams at the moment work a balance between two main systems. One of them is just a massive great hole in the arse of the car. 
most F1 cars will have opened up their rear one way or another to force all the hot air out of the back. It's pretty simple, but comes with the downside if you want to keep everything nice and tight and controlled back there. So Haas, for example, have tended to have a much tighter rear end. In Emela, you could barely see much of an opening at all, though it was a bit bigger for Spain. So to compensate for this, they have absolutely massive gills or louvres or slots in the bodywork to let the heat out. Teams will balance what works best between the two systems, the hole at the back and the louvres on the side, as it benefits their aero package. What's important is not to let this ejected hot air too heavily affect or disrupt the cool outer body air being used to work the downforce at the rear of the car in conjunction with the diffuser. In Spain, Mercedes had some issues with cooling and towards the end of the race, the team suggested some water leak issues. And as we noted, the water is a vital part of the cooling system of the car, so if it was losing pressure, that severely hampers the ability of the engine to run at non-destructive temperatures. But otherwise, it was a hell of a weekend for Mercedes. After such a difficult start to the season, the team upgraded the car and ironed out some of that porpoising they'd been suffering on the straights. It was still coming into play in some of the corners, but they dialed it right down on the straights, which allowed the drivers to actually fight into the braking zones of crucial battle spots like Turn 1. Without this crucial upgrade, Russell wouldn't have been able to hold off Verstappen as he would have had to come off the power early like in previous races. So it made a massive difference to both the drivers' races. Hamilton had to monster his way through from the back and took full advantage of being able to use his speed all the way down the main straight to pass slower cars and maintain strong lap times, despite dragging his car along the floor for a whole lap after practice. Could he have won or mixed it with the Red Bulls as he put it? Mm, that's tricky to answer and feels a little optimistic. I'm actually more annoyed by his first lap puncture as he was the only driver to start on mediums and I was really curious to see how that would have played out as Pirelli did recommend starting on mediums but no one else actually did it. Anyway, Hamilton ran what was essentially a two-stop race if you ignore lap one with everyone ahead of him running aggressive three stops. Being out of place in the race allowed him to run fast, stay out of fights with cars of his equal and look after the tyres while continuing to push. Now, he wouldn't have been able to do any of that if he'd have been among the top six throughout the race, but that's where the curiosity of starting on the medium tyres comes in. He could have actually been out of sync with everyone and found a way to forge his way through via strategy. To a win? Probably not. You never know. And the thing is, we truly will never know because that scenario creates a cascading butterfly effect. A multi-tyre of madness. Toto was asked before the race how many strategies Mercedes had ready to go and he essentially said, Pre-prepared strategies were out the window as they would have to be reactive as the tyres got destroyed and the race would be won by those who could be nimble, fast and be on the right tyre at the right time and manage them well. And that's kind of what happened. Teams were constantly reacting to the situation around them. Max switched to a three-stop to get out of his battle with Russell and find some clear track to exhibit his pace. Perez pulled out of sync with the leaders initially but then covered Russell midway through the race to grab the lead. Now, if Hamilton had been among all that, strategies would have played out differently again, with Mercedes not yet being at the pace of the Red Bulls and Ferrari on even footing. I think they would have struggled to force a win. But looking at the lap times of the top four as they were, Hamilton pulled out an extremely impressive race, often matching pace of the Red Bulls while pulling back all of his lost lap time from lap one by taking one less pit stop in the main race. And Russell defended brilliantly against Verstappen when it seemed like Max would breeze past. Sure, Verstappen's DRS was broken and without that issue it would have been much easier pickings, but even when Max did successfully pass, Russell came back at him and retook the position. Mercedes really are on the ascendance now. And the timing of Mercedes wriggling their way into front-running contention has come at exactly the right time for us, the viewers. The championship has flipped at the front with Verstappen and Red Bull taking control of both titles for the first time this season. And Mercedes, despite their struggles, have consistently been bagging points through their troubled weekends. Sometimes through luck, but they've been there to pick up the pieces and they've got the points to show for it. So if they do suddenly find themselves able to fight for wins, that's going to get very messy for Ferrari and Red Bull's fight. Even if Merck aren't championship contenders, if they insert themselves into the middle of the main four cars on a race-by-race -race basis, that will massively change the potential point swings on offer. But we might still see pretty big point swings as this championship progresses. Reliability has shown itself to be a key issue already, with both Ferrari and Red Bull's main drivers suffering hard, and even Mercedes fighting off gremlins in Spain. Sainz is currently fighting himself at the moment, but the gremlins could come for him too and hold off his abilities to support the team. 
power units are already being rinsed up and down the field, so I think we're going to expect another year of grid penalties in the back end of the season. Taking them strategically and making hay on the good days could decide the title. And speaking of deciding the title, did Red Bull really need to pull the team orders card on Perez this race? Twice even. Once for the lead. Well, okay, look, let's be realistic about one thing. Verstappen is Red Bull's title hope. Perez is good. But if one thing's clear about this season, it's how Leclerc and Verstappen are just in another league compared to everyone else right now. Race after race, they've just disappeared up the road. So if Red Bull wants to maximise results, they're going to have to get behind Verstappen. And the second thing to remember is Verstappen has suffered two reliability-based DNFs this season already. So Red Bull need to get him as many points back as possible to get on terms with Leclerc, especially when Charles suffers a DNF of his own. Now having said all that, Perez had already moved over for Verstappen once before. He had two cracks at overtaking Russell early on and then was told to let Max have a go. Max then had about 200 attempts to an overtake and didn't manage it. Also, Perez didn't careen off into the gravel. Max did. So you could say Perez basically did earn the lead of the race by driving well and working the strategy. So he earned the right to be there. Yeah, Max was on much faster tyres at the end of the race, so probably would have breezed past him with ease. He had two seconds a lap in hand. But I don't know, just maybe let Max take the win for himself if it really was that easy. Let Checo know that Max is on super quick tyres and don't crash into him. But at least let him think he doesn't just have to give up the win whenever Max is nearby. You know, keep up the morale. Red Bull aren't great at working their second driver well, so let's hope Perez doesn't become bitter and disillusioned like Mark Webber. Because he could still get a lot out of that seat if he plays the game right. He really is not bad for a number two driver, and that's the one card Red Bull haven't always had in their hand. And so now we go to Monaco. And while these 2022 cars have been a revelation this year, this track is the one place where it seems they will be worse. So, good thing for us that storms are brewing. This video was brought to you by Bellroy, who are offering you lovely people 10% off anything on bellroy.com. Over the past decade, Bellroy have focused on bringing a philosophy of novel, efficient design and style to their carryable accessories. I'm personally getting more particular over my carry balls. I don't want things too bulky. I want things that have actually been given some thought as to how I'll use them. I don't want to feel like I'm lugging around the whole world. And Bellroy makes products that are actually well made and light and functional. Your bags, your wallets, your tech cases, phone cases that hold your cards in their stand, jackets for your AirPods, and even cases for your AirTags. You need a neat way to keep your keys on you? They've got a neat thing to hold your keys. I've got their slim sleeve, which is light, slim, looks great, and is accessible. No faffing, just like all of their gear. And they're a great company, a B Corp operating as a force for good environmentally, sustainability-wise, and in charitable support. Their leather is gold rating sourced, and their synthetics are sustainably produced. Which is good. I want more of that kind of thing. So if you want to explore their range and get yourself something nice for your kit, go to the link in the description of this video and get 10% off anything from Bellroy's site.